Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton and my co-host is... Michael Glinka. Hey everyone. Uh, we're covering uh, chapters one and two of part two, Family, from book one, Dawn, of Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy. Um, and uh, I'm, I've read this before. I'm playing the role of the, the uh, enigmatic alien species who's uh, come along to uh, uh, subject my co-host here to some questionable experiments um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah and i don't know what's gonna happen so each time i have to predict and then find out if my predictions are on, are on spot or whether i'm way way off tangent uh on, it. on that subject uh shall we uh open up with your predictions from from last week sure um last week we've um the chapter was long. We had a two-hour recording, and um, it really ended at the point where it was hard for me to predict anything. Um, mm. But the only two predictions I came up with is uh, was uh, we will meet uh, Chitaya's family, and that that Lilith is gonna try to get used to her new place and the being she's living with now. Uh, Which seems pretty accurate it's, yeah i think it's pretty accurate um <clears throat> the only thing is uh i need to say up front now is that i sort of forgot myself uh dear audience um because i started reading the chapter and then once i started reading it because today we'll cover chapter one and two mm-hmm. i forgot to do the chapter uh, uh two predictions ah. Okay. So I started I reading and I really, I, I honestly forgot myself <laughs> to to stop and make the predictions to, uh, it was a really short chapter. Chapter one is very short, but yeah. I just simply forgot myself. And, and to be fair, to be fair, it's quite hard to, it was quite, I wouldn't be able to predict what the chapter two was going to be. Like I generally wouldn't be able to, but anyway, we'll get to it once, <laughs> once, <laughs> once we get there. Okay then. Um, do you want to open with your your summary of of uh, the chapter so far? Sure. Um, so, so in chapter one, um, we have a short introduction to Chitaya's family, uh, his wife, and here, please, Richard, correct my pronunciation. Um, uh, I Tadine. don't know if I can help you. Tadine. Uh, Tadine. Yeah. Yes. That's how I read that. Um, that's his name. His wife's name. Uh, her full name is Carl Chitaya Tadine Lel Kaguyat. I at Dinso. Um, uh, yeah. his Uloi mate, uh, Kahguyat, and his full, mm. its full name was Achtre, 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 Kahguya, Achtkal, Lel, Tahia, Tedin, At Dinso, and uh, Tahia's child, Nikanj. Is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nikanj. Yeah, that's um, how it was read to me in the audiobook. <laughs> okay. Kal Nikanj o Tahia Tedinka Tedinka Ach Dinso. So just on this short note is that I realized that yeah. each of their names is actually that the long name contains all of the sort of previous names from other yeah. family members. I think it, it describes like all of their relationships to one another and then their kind of broader family. So they all have Aj Dinso on the end. So yes, they, you know, because the one, of the three, one of the three, there are one of the three, um, uh, like the tr- tribes, let's call them. Yes, yeah, uh, I, I've forgotten the names of the other two, um, off the top of my head, but yeah, the the ones that stay on the ship, the ones that go down to earth, and the ones that um, uh, create a new ship, the three different tribes, and the Dinso are the ones that are going to stay on the earth. That's correct. And then they, I think the rest of the structure. Uh, contains their their relationships to one another, so that you know, they've all got um, like Tadine has has Chitaya's uh, name there, so there's Carl. So Kaya. I think yeah, I think Carl maybe means uh, wife too or something. Chitaya Tadine, so that's yeah. the Chitaya's name and Tadine's, and then Lel mm-hmm. Kaguyat, which is the o- Oloi, uh, the third, mm. the, the second mate. Or the third mate, depending on how you count it. Um, yeah. So that's and then you have the same um, partner of Steyer by Kaguyat or something to that effect. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and then Uloi has the same. I guess the Achtre 
Kaguya Tkal is the, I don't know, maybe the origin of the the name of Kaguya. Presumably, that would be like, yeah, I'm not quite sure what to surmise about exactly. Yeah. Achtre, maybe that, achtre what achtre, that does it could mean. Yeah. But then... I'm guessing that might be its, it's um, other relations, maybe. Maybe that's the family is kind of traced through the Uloi, perhaps, and the Achtre and the Kal, but mm. are other relations. Mm-hmm. And then you have the Lelj Taya Tadin, meaning that in relationship possibly with yeah. uh, Taya and Tadin. And then mm-hmm. you have Nikanj, who has uh, basically both Taya Tadin and Kaguyat names. Mm. Um, the double O U basically indicates mm. uh, from. Chitaya, Presumably, Tadin yeah. and Kaya. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's like um, in Russian when you have uh, people's name, uh, like father's name in the surname. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I mentioned this when we first got um, uh, Chitaya's full name. I think it was a bit like patronymics. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. As the chapter, of course, follows, and it, uh, we find about a bit more about the sort of tradition, eating tradition, was where each time mm. a person will take a turn if they feel each uh, or everyone's uh, dishes, which I think is great, Mike. Like, but then I eat the fastest. Well, I personally eat the fastest uh, <laughs> table, so um, I think nobody, everybody would hate me when I just like give me more. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one, and it's kind of um, it, it seems like you're kind of choosing some of the food that you'd be giving to the others in the group as well. As yeah, that was an, an interesting way of doing it, but. Yeah, I, I like that as an eating tradition. It's quite, uh, uh, I think we should introduce something fun. like this uh, in future, mm. like, you know, a start new tradition. <laughs> mm. And they immediately include Lilith in that process. Right? Oh, She's yes, yes. given everyone's bowl to fill up whenever she goes to fill up her own. Uh, There's no mm. thing like guest or something. You, you're mm. part of the family and mm. that's it, like. Um, and it's it's all human food as well, which is an interesting. Yes, uh, yes, this is one thing that's in it, it's all human food, and mm. uh, which we'll get into it in a second. Um, and um, <clears throat> we learned that Taya can control um, his next energy expenditure, um, considering mm. the fact that he had not eaten at all during the stay with Lilith. And furthermore, we find that, that her, perspe- her perception of time is warped a bit because hmm. um, her body drifted away from the natural 24-hour body cycle and the days actually feel um, prolonged for her, in fact. Uh, I think, well, shorter, right? Uh, in, well, her days are prolonged, but her perception of time is is shortened, effectively. Right? Yes. She, she, yeah. she thought it was a much shorter time than six days that she ended up spending in the room with, with Daya. Which it's a, it's a documented phenomenon, right? People, um, when they don't have light cues to uh, reset the circadian clocks, their day-night cycle tends to drift a little bit longer. I think somewhere on the order of twenty-five hours is typical. Is it okay? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty Does it common. Does it happen in, to like northern, a very northern or southern of the Earth hemispheres, like I Iceland or something that. like that? Because there are some cities, towns. For example, like in Norway, that they basically see sun maybe mm. for six months nonstop, and then they don't see it again for another six months. So, yeah, I mean, I know seasonal affective disorder is more common in those kind of extreme uh, light conditions, okay. and so a lot of um, people with um, uh, sort of complete blindness, so they don't have the necessary cells, uh, have this problem. They drift uh, with their circadian cycle. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't heard that. That's interesting. So, uh, people have done a bunch of research on it for things like um, trying to do uh, uh, acclimatizing people to having a slightly longer circadian cycle, usually aiming for the, what is it, 24.65 hours that is a Martian sol. So if we ever go to Mars, can we adapt successfully to a Martian day-night cycle? And apparently, yes. Okay. But how 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 much, how different is the Martian um, day-night cycle? A yeah, sol is only... 24.65 hours long if memory serves uh, so it's not much of a drift by comparison with Earth and we find ourselves um, that uh, we've learned that Lilith does not like the Uloi of Taya's family hmm. uh, she finds it uh, as quote here smug and it tended to treat her condensingly 
Um, and even though Chitaya claimed there was no hierarchy, Lilith felt that Uloi was the head of the house as everyone deferred to it. Yeah, yeah, I think um, there's a couple of uh, phrases in there. She says, some things deserve to be called it. She was kind of thinking that when um, she was noting on the fact that the, uh, the it new to pro turn was being used to refer to, to the, the Uloi. Um, I think she had like condescending bastard went through her head at some point, and um... but the Uloi didn't didn't the Uloi find pleasure in that being described it. I I did not understand fully that that paragraph because in the book it said that um, the Uloi found pleasure that Onkali described it as it. Don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't I didn't pick up on that. Uh, I'm not sure why that would be the case strange it is a strange thing but we find mm. a bit more about the um, sort of physical description of the family we find that Tadin, uh Chitaya's wife is tall like very tall much taller than um Chitaya, i think and then the uloi kaguyat is almost little size slightly larger than Chitaya, but considerably smaller than Tadin. And they had four arms, well, two arms and two arm-sized tentacles that were big, gray, and rough, looking like elephant trunks. And we had, I mean, it's late in the chap- in chapter two that it uh, Nikanj was small, uh, half the size, I think, of uh, Lilith, uh, but also being an Uloi with two, sm- uh, but only with two arms. Yeah, yeah, I think it was, it was half the size ish of her and like one and a half times her age approximately but still maturing so still um uh yeah like have quite a long uh maturation period well i guess if you i mean i guess considering the whole the stasis and stuff like that i guess um the maturation is probably gonna be slower um hmm. considering yeah the situation so it's an it's an interesting thing that like if you've got a stasis technology, it seems like you'd need, or even if you had, you know, like near light speed tech, you'd, you'd need means of expressing um, subjective time for people, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you need a separate way of saying, you know, this person spent X amount of time relative to the rest of us in in you know in sleep or like a near relativistic speeds or whatever and then their subjective time so i think you'd adapt to a, a system of measuring age in subjective elapsed elapsed time rather than just having um a system that was kind of assuming time was a constant for everyone mm. so i'm i'm guessing that when they talk about age they talk about actual like el- subjective elapsed time for an individual as opposed to necessarily you know spending some time in stasis or whatever I guess, but there has to be some sort of um, ability to um, measure the time. Hmm. Because, I mean, this is one of those things that um, for humans, measurement of time really also sped up the technological revolution. Um, as oh, yeah, yeah. Especially, you know, traveling, long distance traveling. I'm just saying that they'd need a more sophisticated way of... of um talking about the measurement of time in a sense in that they'd, they'd need a way of representing mm-hmm. time spent in suspension of some uh, you know in some sense i guess so but then the chapter continues about the um, um idea of the food um mm-hmm. Lilith is generally um, curious about how can they eat food from earth considering the fact that she couldn't eat this. And um, we find that there is a little amount of things that are poisonous to Onkali. Whereas the traditional Onkali food uh, would be very poisonous to Lilith. And mm. then the conversation sort of drifts in a bit of dangerous territory where Lilith being probed and annoyed by the Uloi asks if anything, there's anything that actually poisons them. And she learns that there's, there is, depending on the situation, partially hmm. depending if they're too old too slow to resolve it if they're injured because they can be poisoned because they're, regi- they're focusing on regeneration or if they're young yeah. because they don't know how to resolve the poison and then the uloi then pokes at the lid asking that knowing this would she poison the child which of course caused Lilith 
increase of dislike towards the Uloi and the chapter ending with the fact that Uloi wanted Lilith to learn more about them, but within reason. Yeah, the within reason is an interesting qualifier, right? Yeah, yeah. it's it's mm-hmm. it's like as referencing back to the previous um um recording we had previous chapters. It's the, still the same sort of attitude towards Lilith. They their ability, their attitude is so much different compared to uh humans, right? Like to the the they they think oh there's no hierarchy but then there's the sort of not tangible but like f- Lilith can feel there's some sort of hierarchy in the house with the Ulo on top and yeah. then the whole idea of not being told everything whereas they know everything about us basically yeah I mean the most charitable spin I can put on it is that um, Lilith's perceptual capabilities are limited by comparison with theirs and she doesn't have this kind of um ability to to you know see the the genetics or whatever um so perhaps the within reason is referring Mm -hmm. to her limitations Mm -hmm. in her ability to understand comprehend the complexity of their society and biology but yeah there definitely seems to be an overtone of something more than just that uh that might be the rationalization they use I guess if you can perceive something as intimate as someone, some being's genetics, I guess the society built on that um, will have some even deeper intrinsic, like um, there's going to be some characteristic that we don't perceive and yet they do because simply Mm. they can, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I possibly. thought that chapter was quite short, but quite interesting. We we find quite um, a bit about the family. I'm curious yeah. about Shtaya's, um wife. I wonder what's what's gonna be because even in chapter two, we are not introduced much to his wife yet. So I wonder what's gonna be the interaction. Yeah, and so Tadine has yet as of yet not said much i think she's described as being silent a couple of times yeah i mean you know if if your uh husband slash wife spends six days with a another being of an opposite sex uh and non-stop i guess i would also give them a call a uh, silent treatment <laughs> <laughs> yeah although they seem to have a it, it's it's we don't really know much about their attitudes towards uh sex and relationships uh at all really. no uh, no we don't and i think um unknown. Uh, actually speaking of that the next chapter actually goes into that um uh, thought uh, we we learn a bit more our little th- uh, thoughts about this whole idea about the sex and relationship which she, she also ponders that so um, hmm, yeah it's they, they have that three-way structure anyway right they've got this this uh, three genders effectively so that's a, a, a very different structure mm-hmm. uh, as it is so i i think the the one thing of of science sort of um science related or more like mm-hmm. conversation we can talk about science was i was wondering what about that we, we had this conversation before about like the ability to eat something or absorb use the nutrients from Mm, uh, mm. of different species of different planets if they're not um, able to you know if they haven't encountered something before so like about yeah. the L and the left and right um, mm. um, shape yeah, the, yeah. the amino acids and stuff like that so I was just wondering because in here we see clearly that they can eat earth um, food whereas obviously Lilith cannot eat everything what they eat mm. so I just wonder although they did say they had to learn to eat earth food. Mm, mm. So I, I suspect that there's an element of um, un- understanding kind of what, what's there and then l- sort of genetically learning, right? Getting the, the relevant enzymes to break stuff down or whatever um, so that they can actually consume it safely. But it seems as though they have the, the capacity to kind of uh, look at and then devise a way of, of dealing with uh, different chemical structures in their diets the whole thing of the the possibility of poisoning them and the suggestion was that basically they could find a way of adapting to more or less any poison 
in you know, in almost in real time, right? So if you poisoned them, they'd figure out a way around it. It's interesting because if you think about it, let's take um, last time we talked about botulin, right? It's it's a neurotoxin, mm-hmm. and I mean, if there's something that attacks your neural system straight away, how can you respond to it? I mean, you would have to have some a bit some way to separate the sort of the, the area of where the poison is uh, taking place. Um, but I guess, well, maybe I just answered my own question because they have the ability mm. to chemically stimulate, um, send chemical cues anywhere because they use the chemical cues to um, direct the ship and themselves. I guess they have inside, like intr- they can direct their chemical cues inside of them just to respond and maybe um, isolate the area where the poison has poisoning has occurred. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that it, it must be something to that effect. Yeah, actually, it reminds me of. Um, have you read Dune? No, but I played the game. Frank Herbert. I, I I know yeah. about Dune. Don't go yeah, on. Yeah. There's, there's a sequence in that where where Paul Atreides is is like learning to digest some particular poison, and he has like a conscious awareness of what's going on. He has to like synthesize an enzyme, or whatever, to to uh, uh, break down this this compound that he's consumed. Um, and it struck me as being somewhat similar to that kind of sequence, right? He, uh-huh. He's able to perceive, or, or you know, they're, they're able to perceive this this molecule that they've ingested, and they can come up with something to break it down Mm -hmm. Um, maybe we should next one of the next books uh, consider when we go through them to consider is the dune because i really want to read it but i wonder how's the science there as well yeah yeah there's there's not much to digest on the science front there it's a bit of an odd one okay okay (laughs) yeah now, because I remember, just, this is a bit of a topic, everyone, but I remember when I was a mm-hmm. kid, my father had a game, it was a strategy game, RTS game, uh, based mm-hmm. on the um, Dune, on the Dune, and okay. it was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's it, a lot of, like, sort of deep politicking strategy, complex games played with one another kind of uh, stuff going on there but Mm -hmm. they actually have an explicitly a technological society in many ways uh with certain exemptions but yeah that's kind of a it's another topic okay Uh, okay well anyway so i just wanted to say that i have (laughs) not made predictions and to be honest my predictions would be probably way off to what the how the (laughs) where, where she where she where the author went with the with the chapter uh, I mm-hmm. thought maybe when I finished, I was like, oh, okay, maybe we'll know more about the family. It'll be slow, but no, nope, it's completely uh, different. But anyway, let me maybe introduce the chapter two, start introducing it. What do you think? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, so the chapter starts with Lilith being taken to Sharad um, by the mm-hmm. Uloi. Uh, although it's obvious that she would prefer to be taken by Chitaya, uh, mm. She knows that he hasn't seen his wife in a while and wonders if they say, if they need some private time for themselves, as we discussed earlier, uh, mm. which actually makes her think start thinking about the sex organs of the Onkali. Um, but we know that she never asks. But she she lo- she it was in the chapter described that she looked at Oloi, the one of the two tentacles that were wrapped around him, and she was wondering whether it's the sex organs. But yeah, and that, just to pick up on that point like her kind of dislike for kaguya continues a little bit there and it, it reveals a little bit more about her relationship with shdaya now as well in that she thinks how had shdaya connected himself to such a creature about kaguya and like just very shortly before she was super freaked out by shdaya yeah so her whole stockholm syndrome play acclimatizing her to him seems to have worked because she's having this uh you know what does Shdaya see in this guy? Kind of reaction to <laughs> Kaguya. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, this is, this sounds like a full-on yeah. Stockholm syndrome there. Hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, the chapter continues as she's led by Kaguya to Sharad, uh, and the Uloi is leading her through a street, and it's, it can be descri- described as full of other onkali, walking hmm. or riding floating devices. She notices a lot of um, cargo being transported, such as unrecognizable fried uh, transparent 
beach ball sized blue spheres filled with some liquids, two foot long centipede like animals stuck in rectangular cages, great trays of oblong green shapes about six feet long and three feet th- thick. This last writhed slowly, blindly. And when she prompted Kaglia uh, about it and asked him a few questions, he never really responded to her, uh, which obviously made her angry, and yep. which led to her losing Kaguya from her side because she just ripped his her hand off him, and then he just disappeared in the sea of other Onkali, and then she yep. realized that oh, actually, I have no idea how to um, recognize one from another, mm-hmm. but it was just to uh, but he we pranked her. He was actually beside her all the time, just uh, sneak behind her. But then we finally yeah. reach the place where Sharad is. Um, it is one of those green things she saw in, uh, being transported. Um, that's where he's being kept. Um, hmm. We learn that he won't be awakened yet because, the, as, uh, as Kaguya said, the human who will be guiding and training him and his family has not begun the training yet. Hmm. And we learn more about the plant that keeps Sharad in. Uh, it said uh, that it used to be a plant that would capture and trap living animals, keeping them alive using their CO2 and supply them with oxygen while slowly digesting non-essential parts of their bodies, such as limbs, skin, sensory organs. The plants even mm. pass some of their own substance through their prey to nourish the prey and keep it alive as, uh, as long as possible. And the plants were enriched by the prey's waste products. They gave a very, very long death. So we learned that the prey would not feel anything, just sleep. And that um, when asked, let us was how does Sharad get his oxygen? He, we learned that he's given a perfect mix of gases necessary for his mm-hmm. survival. Our plant benefits from the suit and the waste produced by Sharad. Um, this and the light supply um, is what the plant actually needs. Um, yeah. And when, of course, as in any human being, when Liv touched the plant, it started to engulf her. And before she realized, she's actually being trapped by it until um, Kaguya, by touching uh, through a, a, the plant, with releasing some chemical sensors, uh, allowed her to release her and tells her that Sharad is small and the plant probably needs more of the nutrients. Um, so it probably engulfed her as well. Um, yeah. And that worrying. makes Willith realize that she was kept in such a thing as well. Yeah, it's a bit of a disturbing realization, right? You've been sat inside a weird carnivorous plant for the last <laughs> 250 years. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> so, but that this is this is where she asked actually Kaguya why she wasn't digested, and we learned that they were genetically modified. The plants were genetically modified, changing the requirements mm. and making them respond to the chemical stimuli. They've turned the plants into a tool, effectively. They found a function that was close to what they Needed, wanted yeah. and just tweaked it and made them into a, a, yeah, a piece of technology. See, and this is where Lilith, uh, you know, says to Kaguya that oh, it's one thing to do it to a plant, another to mm. uh, an intelligent self-aware being. And Uloi argues back then that they, what they do is what they do. Right, this is what they do, but they would never kill them or enslave her children. And Kaguya also says that that to her that there was no life on earth when ancestral Onkali left their own homeworld, and they never did such thing as Lilith described. But Lilith said that even if they did, they would never tell her. And I think that's mm. a good point that they would probably never tell her. Yeah, although they have broadly speaking been honest. They they don't seem to lie that much, as far as we can tell so far. They just don't say anything whenever you ask them something where they don't want to tell you the answer. They rarely, like, I don't think we've yet caught them in an explicit instance of saying something that was untrue. I guess it's more, well, yes, I think you said it before in previous one of the previous um, recordings that they they say Mm. what you need to know, but not the whole picture. Oh yeah, they're definitely very economical with the truth and they'll kind of manipulate what you think by e- excluding certain pieces of information so that you know they, they can still effectively lie to you, but they don't seem to be too keen on doing it by directly lying to you, just by 
controlling what information you have access to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think this is a good point to, before we continue with the chapter, is that there's two things I wanted to discuss Yeah. that really st struck me personally. is Obviously, what the plant is one thing, but the first thing was the floating vehicles that the uh, Onkali were using to, to move around because, um, yeah. as Lilith described, it was they, they were floating an inch above the ground. Um so the question is, how how does it like? I I sort of imagine them sort of being like those disc or a platform of some sort, a thin platform. Uh, so they they um almost struck me as being like um uh, dollies, you know, for like moving stuff around in in um shops or whatever, just you know, like little wheels and like a board and some kind of thing to hold on to. Mm -hmm. Like a, they they didn't seem like very enclosed vehicles, more just sort of these you know, like. Uh, open freight carrier things or whatever. Yeah. It's a bit of a, uh, a strange kind of image. But yeah, the fact they hover off the floor is um, yeah, that says something about the technology, right? Um, because I'm not quite sure what, but... Because I was thinking there could be two from our perspective, right? There could hmm. be two possible explanations. Uh, yeah. One, anti-gravity. Some sort of anti-gravity mm -hmm. tool that allows them to hover. Or two, superconductivity. Um, of the material because but the one thing I was thinking about this more uh, the anti-gravity is well I mean it's quite a far-fetched idea I would say it's the one that we don't r really have a good handle on how the physics of that yes. makes sense right that's kind of yeah we don't even know where to start with that one and where yeah we can't really describe is. it in any way because it's Hmm. Yeah, it's something that we can't. It, it's obviously, in by definition, we're not talking about anti gravity in the form of that the object doesn't have a mass. Um, it's more of the uh, ability to fight off the forces of gravity. Um, hmm. So it could potentially have something underneath that an engine that doesn't produce any. Uh, like any noise or heat or anything is just like allows for a hot levitation but i think it's more mm. than leads towards the superconductivity it's it's worth observing we don't know how they have gravity on their ship right i mean at this point it could be the the traditional simple way you know the the whole spin the thing around to get centripetal force mm -hmm. but i don't think we i don't recall explicitly getting that as no no there's no gravity there's no explanation to that i s to be honest, I didn't even think about it when you mentioned that. Um, I just sort of, at the moment, ignored this idea because I was thinking that the idea here, um, there's another problem because the whole ship is organic. Yeah. And superconductivity at the moment obviously would mean that it has to be room temperature superconductivity. And for that, mm -hmm. we need certain materials that to be able and the, at the moment from our science uh, or, uh, in the world is that uh, either mm. if you want to have the room temperature conductivity you have to have incredibly high pressure uh, on yeah. certain metals and that's not really uh, possible um, whereas normal circumstance superconductivity requires very low temperatures we're talking about 3 Kelvin which is minus 270 um, degrees uh, Celsius mm. um, yeah well I suppose there are some quantum systems in biology where we don't really, or what we think are quantum systems in biology, we don't have a good understanding of how that state is maintained. So, um, like magnetoception, so the ability of certain birds to perceive magnetic field strength, mm -hmm. is so thought to be mediated by a quantum effect. Okay. Uh, where you've got, um, I think it's a couple of electrons, might be protons, I forget, a couple of particles that are entangled with one another and then separated within. Um, a, a molecule that's, that's um, in the, um, the receptor that's acting to perceive this in, in the eye, I think, mostly. Um, and then the magnetic field strength fluctuations can cause them to, to lose entanglement or something like that, which then causes a, a signal, which we think is how that process works very loosely. Um, at least that's my understanding. But how you would successfully maintain a moderately persistent entanglement over a short but substantial distance in a system that's operating at you know 37-ish mm -hmm. degrees um 
is not well understood. Yeah. Like we don't know how that kind of entanglement could be maintained. So you could potentially have something analogous to that in that you've got uh, something that can maintain that uh, weird electron tunneling state that's necessary for the superconductivity to take place that's mediated by some biological process. I actually thought a bit differently. I thought maybe the cells that the material, whatever the material um, that makes of the as the floor could potentially have mm-hmm. a higher concentration of metals in them just to counter oh, this, yeah. I- this idea. Just That would be probably the simplest way to solve mm-hmm. this problem. But just for yeah, definitely. all of our listeners, superconductivity is a phenomenon where when you decrease the temperature of certain materials, metals, elements, they basically allow electricity to to co- conduct electricity without any resistance. It's literally zero resistance. Um, and in fact, there's an experiment uh, that basically um, proved this by um, basically allowing for uh, electrons to flow in a closed circuit being submerged in liquid helium and there's no loss of co- uh, electricity in that circuit so the f- power source was taken away but the co- flow of electrons is still taking place hmm. so this is what superconductivity means and um, there are I'm sure a lot of our listeners um, have seen if not I encourage to look into the videos that represent superconductivity in form of um, a magnet on top of a metal ray where they can float and move around with no problem because yeah th- those are super fun um, yeah. as I, I once did that actually with a, oh, did you? I made a yttrium barium copper oxide uh, superconducting disc mm-hmm. and submerged that in liquid nitrogen and then had them hovering um, on on top of one another uh, it, it yeah it's really fun to do in person right uh where did you do it's it like nothing else because it's, it's like, i was doing some uh work experience at the university of surrey over the summer oh, okay one year, okay and it was one of, one of the things they let us do was um synthesize these little discs of yttrium barium copper oxide oh okay that uh, sounds awesome was, i thought maybe yeah, there's was some really possibility good. to anybody just to go somewhere and do it, something like this because it sounds super fun i've seen it done at um a couple of science expos where they have one of those little um, uh, maglev demonstrations mm-hmm. where they've got a disc of it's usually yttrium barium copper oxide because that is it's relatively high temperature you can do it in liquid nitrogen instead of liquid helium helium's a lot harder to play around with uh, so you know you you can like slide those around a, a, a track of magnets at zero friction um, yeah so yeah this this basically makes the electrons flow non-stop uh without any friction mm. causing no friction between the flow of uh and also the magnetic field is so strong because of that that allows for things to basically float above uh metals above metals which is really something that i can sort of imagine being the future and what currently is being really pursued because if it happens mm. then um incre- like you know trains like at the moment we do have a um uh, maglevs like the super the bullet trains that travel um yeah. using this sort of uh, idea um but in potentially in the future we'll be able to utilize in bigger bigger speeds yeah so the 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 hyperloop technology that is mostly kind of at the head of the pack at the moment is basically maglev in a partially evacuated tube so you have zero friction from the rails because you're levitating above them and zero atmospheric friction or at least very low because there's no atmosphere around the thing Mm -hmm. so you can get like speeds that are close to airliners but you know in a in a pod in a train effectively we had this discussion before and the idea of stopping this thing was like a big jelly wasn't it did you you remember correctly uh i don't remember that one no but i mean i think they <laughs> i think they mostly just use the the same magnetic effect that they did to float them to slow them down okay um unless they're doing some kind of emergency braking but yeah you have to be careful with that because high g's at that speed um, if you suddenly stop plop, basically yeah. everybody inside yeah, is you, a pancake you, yeah. yeah yeah you have to slowly ramp up to speed as well um otherwise you know you get the whole 
fighter pilot experience <laughs> of blacking out. It's... I mean, you know, it's one thing when you're in a plane and you just feel that sort of speed increase in acceleration mm. when you're about to take off. And then there's an this elevator. thing when you like suddenly increase that several several fall. It's like, oh! Hmm. Yeah, it, it gets a bit much. But it does mean potentially if, if you have your well-secured cargo, you can do super fast cargo transport. Because, mm. you know, if cargo can take many more Gs than people, right, you can fire them off down a hyperloop line at much higher speeds, potentially. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about the stasis plans, by the way, because uh, I think this is yes. probably the, the, the part that's probably the most, um, well, in, in our field, I would say. So basically, they're using a carnivorous plants, like similar to Venus flytraps in, in on Earth, but these guys are basically like a carnivorous aloe vera <laughs> plant, <laughs> I would say. Okay, I don't know much about aloe vera. Uh, well, I mean, the only reason why I say aloe because it has the inside of it is so good for humans. You know, it's so um, uh, um, it, mm. it has these properties to really to heal uh, wounds and you know stuff mm. like that. So I just imagine it being like this this sort of massive aloe vera um, plant that basically gobbles you up and then heals you while taking your excrements and your uh, ex, you know. Uh, carbon mm. dioxide to to survive it seems like it's also a, a water-based plant because it's in i think they mentioned that it's in water like it floats in mm -hmm. water at mm -hmm. some point and then it get they ha it's like excreted out of a sphincter in the wall when when they get the the um that like coffin shaped yes hunk of plant with um uh, uh, uh what's his name um uh charade charade yeah that's it that's it yeah uh, um when they get him out of that vault where they're all stored it seems to be just a room filled with water and with the right kind of light mm -hmm. so presumably some light that will penetrate through that water or maybe they float on the surface i'm not sure but uh yeah it's a, a bit of a strange picture like all these kind of to be honest, floating it's, plant uh, coffins in water yeah i i think to be honest <laughs> i think this is uh, something that i uh, when i imagine it right it has to be something that mm -hmm. So it this plant produces all the nutrients and the oxygen and mi mixture of uh, gases necessary for whatever being that's keeping it inside to survive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it uses its excrements and the carbon dioxide to um, for its own survival as well as producing the um, necessary things for the being inside. And then it uses light yep. to survive itself, right? So it's the nutrients mm -hmm. come from the the being that is stored inside, whereas the energy is from the light and carbon dioxide, obviously. So yep. this is normal photosynthesis uh, that's taking place. But the idea of using the excrements, right? Because, I mean, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, excrements are waste product of our bodies, things that were not processed and or processed in a way that it's not, useful anymore for our bodies and to i mean let's take in the urine the urea right this is the side product of the um of the metabolism so to reverse that back to any amino acids or anything would require a lot of energy for it to Unless I'm thinking it differently, wrongly, that the nutri the, the excrements that are used by the plant, that are produced by the being that's inside, are used by the plant, and the plant is giving the being that the human is, for example, st uh, st put inside of the plant from the ship itself. Yeah, I mean, for, I was thinking about how this might make sense as a as a um, a, a way of getting nutrients. I mean, most um, carnivorous plants in our world do it to get protein, mm -hmm. right? They, they need additional protein from whatever it is that they're eating. But that doesn't seem to be the case. At least that's not how it's described here. It's not some protein so much as some rare products and apparently the CO2. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's... I'm, I'm thinking that it, it might use whatever the organisms it traps for some something that they're doing biosynthetically or something that they're doing more efficiently than the plant. So... If, for example, the organisms can respire 
in a way that's more efficient than the plant itself can respire, it might make sense to give them oxygen and get CO two back. Because mm-hmm. right? if it if it's not very good at like getting a high yield on respiration, maybe it can get more CO two to do its biosynthetic stuff from outsourcing its respiration to another organism and then i suppose you might have a store of micronutrients for like rare earth metals or maybe you need the biosynthetic processes of like the gut microbiota of the organism that you're living in to get some weird stuff that you can't synthesize for yourself that was the kind of stuff that i came up with that might make sense for the life cycle of this kind of plan okay um but, i wonder yeah, i wonder because it's a bit of i i think i i think in this case the bulk of um things would have to come from the ship itself where the plant yeah. is connected to i think it has to it has to be something related to that because i just hmm. yeah what you said might be might be what um is happening but in the same time um i i still think it's lacking something Oh yeah, yeah. So at, at this point in time, I, I totally agree with you. I think that the genetically engineered version of these things, as it were, is, is definitely going to be dependent on the ship for a lot of its um, materials to function as it is now. But I was just thinking about how its its wild ancestor would have, like, what 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 makes that life history make sense for that organism. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, actually speaking of uh, like the, um, I wonder what how the uh, Onkali survived before that plant they discovered that plant like let's take I've yeah. hypothesized that they when they left their home world for whatever reason the my biomass of the planet was taking over or they used the whole thing or so whatever and they went on hmm. the travel initially it must have been like as humans imagine it, where if we wanted to go to Alpha Centauri galaxy, for example, where basically in a hundred years of the travel, we would have to mm. basically make babies on the ship because otherwise we would not survive. That's 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 the whole idea. Yeah. We some groups would go travel and basically they would never arrive because it's only the children would that would arrive onto that. Yeah, the whole generation ship concept. So I, I, mm. I suspect that before they discovered those plants, I guess what happened was. They had to dis- they discovered uh they had to do that I assume so yeah uh, and I, I don't know how they would have managed um integrating any new species they came across before they had this right and they must have had to uh not take as long as they did with the humans uh to learn about them you know must have kept some they, they, they couldn't suspend some of the original we captured individuals in time and then only kind of take them off ice when they needed to work with them they'd have to compress that process mm-hmm. of integration uh, yeah right down so yeah I, things might well have been messier i just wonder something because they mentioned something to uh what um kaguya mentioned was that um mm-hmm. when the Onkali left their planet. The humans did not exist, even exist yet on the Earth. Yeah. So life on Earth hadn't yet started. So I wonder because the age of Earth is around four point five billion, and the age of our universe is thirteen point eight billion, right? So I wonder how. F- I think it might be a little more than that. Yeah, now. potentially. My, but like, I just wonder how far ahead does a species have to be in terms of science development to mm. to reach that level of Onkali? Like, let's imagine us humans, right? At this very moment of science, we are nowhere near to what reach to what they, uh, what Onkali have. So I want... Uh, I mean, we, we have... Well, we, we don't have the, the kind of genetic skills that they do. But I think we could probably build a generation ship. Oh, yeah. I no, mean, it I would be a massive undertaking and whatnot. But. I guess we can. But the idea is that um, it would have to be an organic one. I just imagine it. Okay, we are not talking about metal or anything. We're talking about fully organic sort mm. of. So our, our genetic development would have to be, I don't know, several thousand years forward to, to, to even reach that level. Well, it makes me a bit. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know about a thousand, 
I mean, it's, it, like the accelerating rate of progress and everything could be a few hundred. I guess so, but it makes me a bit that. depressed because I'll never reach that stage. We will never be there to to witness that. Ah. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> cryonics. Cryonics. <laughs> just think like, well, you know, Walt Disney just put ourselves in the cryo tubes, uh, cryo tanks full of liquid nitrogen and hope for the best. Yeah. Uh, that's more or less the current strategy with that. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'd put a pretty low probability on that actually working, especially given the the current freezing process. It's, yeah, uh, not quite up to snuff when it comes to uh, preserving brain structure. So, to everyone listening to us at the moment, um, the way scientists, for example, preserve tissues or cells for to for future use is we exchange the water. Uh, with some compounds. Uh, the most commonly used is dimethyl sulfoxide, uh, in short, DMSO, that exchanges the mm-hmm. water um, in the cell, inside of the cell, which basically prevents, uh, because during the freezing, what happens is the crystal of water form in the cell and they basically burst the cell membrane. And to prevent that other compounds use like DMSO uh, that do not form the crystals, or at least they form crystals in a way they don't uh they're not don't penetrate the membrane. That's that's the whole idea. Yeah. So wh- wh- whatever method that you know humans used in like ni- in fifties when you know Walt Disney and, and such uh preserve their bodies, they're f- I think that was actually a bit of an urban legend, but uh the Walt Disney specific story, I think, was a an urban legend. But uh, yes, broadly speaking, that that process it's is probably uh, not understood. That even nowadays, this process is like you know, preserving cells is one thing, but um, preserving a whole body, a brain tissue, especially brain tissue, considering how delicate it is, is something that mm. you know it's. So I would say that there's a very very low probability for all those pe- people who use cryogenic chambers to um um to survive defrosting yeah i am inclined to agree at this point yeah this, the, the, even the people who take the kind of super um futuristic line of i don't know will scan the brain structure and like simulate the map of neurons or whatever for starters Neurons are a lot more complicated than most people in that camp appreciate. It's not just like acting as effectively analogous to a transistor, right? You can't like I I would be very surprised if you got like the person back by reconstructing just the network of neurons without having considerable understanding of what the neurons are doing. And secondly, the chronic processes that are currently working mm-hmm. um or currently being employed are aren't good enough to preserve all those structures. Um even even the version where they lop your head off and pump you full of antifreeze <laughs> before they try to vitrify, vitrify you, they don't get enough perfusion through to the center of the brain to prevent some crystallization, so you lose brain structure. Um, but yeah, they are they're getting better in that direction, right? and there are precedents right uh, uh, in certain things. Um, I know they've successfully vitrified and brought back a rabbit liver, but you know livers are a lot more regenerative than brain Mm -hmm. and um there's the north american wood frog which freezes solid and then defrosts again on an annual basis but it has special adaptations to cope with that that we don't actually if i may so you started Mm -hmm. talking about this stuff and i had got flashbacks of uh my undergrad study and my third year when i was doing neuroscience and actually Mm -hmm. um there is so in hibernation animals, because this, this, in a way, it's sort of um, related to this. Um, when animals hibernate in low temperatures, um, bears, squirrels, etc., they, the, the, obviously, the freezing of the tissue um, of their brains, etc., can cause uh, because the metabolism slows down, meaning that the body temperature mm. is lower, and there's a, therefore there's a higher chance of ice crystals being formed in the soft tissue. Mm. And in fact, uh, so there is actually a theory why they survived this. So, 
for all of the audience, I'm for those more scientifically inclined, uh, I'm sure a lot of you heard about ubiquitination or ubiquitulation, as it should be correctly uh, said. Um, it's a small molecule that basically um, does a lot of functions in the body. It usually takes it's if something in some protein is ubiquitulated, it'll probably go get destroyed. That's the sort of basic problem. Obviously, it does more functions than that, but that's the usual standard function mm. of it. In brains, actually, in fact, there's another a very similar uh, molecule called sumoylation. Uh, the process called taking place called sumoylation. The sumo stands for, I think, similar similar to ubiquitin molecule or something like this. And basically... Yeah, imaginative as usual. Yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> science, hey? I mean, the drosophila yeah. names, come on, at least... Let, let's not go there, actually. Yeah, they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the whole idea is that those um, that simulation of the proteins uh, actually helps to say stimulate regeneration of the tissue. So in normal circumstances, if I remember correctly, bear in mind that's been several years since I last time I I looked into neuroscience. Um, I'll definitely put some references later on. Um, there was a fact that. It, during the normal um, defrosting, what happens is this in the cell, the normal sort of cell damage um, processes get activated. And basically the cells goes, okay, that's enough. I'm killing myself because there's too much damage, right? When yeah. the simulation takes place, actually those processes are stopped. And the cell, oh. and like, uh, because during those processes, a lot of reactive oxygen species uh, are produced that are even causing even more damage. Whereas hmm. with, during simulation, those processes that stimulate the oxygen reactive species formation are stopped. And therefore, no further damage, the cascade of damage is not stimulated. And therefore, the cell has some chance to recover. And that's why the animals can recover. If I remember correctly, ah. so I think there is a okay. possibility. I'd not heard about that mechanism. Yeah, it's. Uh, I to be honest, I I, re I there was a lot of lectures we had on simulation, so I this is one thing I remember really <laughs> well, um, but the mm. details are uh, not not there for, with me. But it's it's something that mm. I think a lot of groups that are uh, in looking into hibernations are actually investigating because um, it might mean that there's a chance for stimulating these processes for people that were cryogenically um, frozen. Hmm. Yeah, or probably more likely uh, other kinds of wound healing processes for the purposes of yes, grant applications. Yes, yes. And <laughs> but yeah, I I will definitely provide some references later because it's, it's a very interesting topic and I think um, it's still being investigated, but I think it's one of those things that um, except for brain there's not much not really investigated i think i mean as i said my knowledge is several years old so maybe it's up now it's completely different maybe a lot of fields are looking into that process or maybe it's not relevant at all anyway, so uh, i think we actually still have a little bit more of the story ah uh, yes apologies for. yes um, we still so should we move on yeah, to the next section let's finish this off so um after visiting uh, Sherrod, the scene changes back to Chitaya's apartment um, where we meet uh, Chitaya's uh, child, Nikanj. Kaguya directs Nikanj to be Lilith's guide and answer all her questions. Um, but basically, Lilith will teach Nikanj about the humans and, the Engli uh, and English because he can't really speak well and vice versa. Nikanj will teach her everything about the Onkali and their language. And then, you know, the normal interaction with a child occurs where uh, he, with his broken, uh, well, he, sorry, he's an Uloi, so an it, uh, um, his broken English wants her to go outside. And when Liv asks if he could, if it could show her how to get out of the, the house, uh, kind of looks at her a bit, but gives, leaves a bit of um, the, like, sort of the, the slime on her hand and then puts her hand on the wall and then that makes her realize that even that without their help she's a prisoner she can't mm. go anywhere because simply can she cannot produce the chemicals for the um for the ship to to do what 
she wants. And finally, yeah. when outside, uh, Nikanj asks her if she can show her off to her friends, and that's the, where the chapter ends. Yeah, so that little door interaction is, is is very interesting there, right? The whole their sort of interface to control everything seems to be chemical. Yes. Right. It's all of the they have this almost like paracrine interaction with everything where they you know they just touch all this biological stuff and it's got receptors for whatever it is that they synthesize and you know carries out the instructions that it's programmed for and then you know they get feedback in the same way it's a it's a really interesting I f- way of interfacing i feel like this is the future of security like this is <laughs> this is like chemically induced doors like you know this is probably the security not even biometrics can um, provide you because you know you it's if you the amount of like just to put in perspective for our listeners um a lot of nowadays um crystal structure uh, well understanding of how proteins the structure of proteins right uh, takes a lot of effort we do have understanding how you know how they bind blah 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 the amino acid in the protein but the idea of generating structure with the computer is still far off because the the 3d perspective of how the, each amino acid interacts with other amino acid within the chain how they fall we have certain rules but it's still quite a far off thing so i can imagine it being incredibly secure system because you can develop an amino acid and you can make them as big as you want or as small as you want and you can use whatever l or d amino acids and you can create whatever you want and that would be to figure out what the code is or like what the protein that's used to the that matches the receptor is probably near nigh impossible to yeah obviously you can i mean you could do all kinds of fun cryptographic stuff with that process as well right the same way we do with computers right you could just uh, uh effectively and it, it's it's like an information technology, yes. but it's based on you know presumably amino acid sequences or nucleic acid sequences as opposed to bit strings. Yeah, and the fun part is is that for example, as you said, encrypted, you could for example have a protein, right? Uh, let's say mm-hmm. wrapped in another protein, and then you produce another enzyme. So that's already complexity that breaks down the pro- the f- original protein, and then that original protein, that whatever uh, substrate of this protein are, are the receptors. So you can literally, yeah. you can increase that system more and more and more secure, make it more by simply, mm. and it's literally you can't figure it out. Like I mean, obviously, just yeah. so everyone yeah. know. Um, um, those in biology and whoever listens to us from the basics of biology, the protein and receptors and their ligands, the proteins that attach to receptors, is not like a key and lock, just so everybody knows. It's not like that. It's not like you have a one key. A lot of proteins can uh, interact with receptors. It's more of like, I imagine it like more like a Pac-Man eating those balls, right? But the ball is quite... It can morph, let's say. Let's the, the key, the lock can morph, right, around the protein. Yep. And um, so a lot of proteins can fit in uh, in the receptors. And this is how, for example, bacteria or viruses spread because they can lock into a receptor present on our cells and um, get engulfed and then reproduce and blah, 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 and et cetera, mm. et cetera, right? So it's... Yeah, uh, this varying degrees of precision with that interaction right you can tolerate a more or less difference or you can be exquisitely precise and only tolerate a very specific sequence yes uh, depending on what kind of function is desired from the receptor absolutely so uh, i would imagine this like in several thousands of years those sort of organic logs being like the standard uh because i just imagine it sorry this is my imagination just going crazy right now but like i just imagine it Mm. being incredibly secure um but then it's like the joke where you know you have a hacker and you want to have a password to the to their encrypted storage Mm. right uh and you know it's like break trying to break the password you know however long is an encryption however strong it is right the reality is you just take a crowbar and then smack the person 
a few times on the knees and you get the password almost immediately <laughs> at least for me i would uh, so yeah. it's it, you know it's 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 same anecdote in here like if the door is weak no matter how long it's strong the the lock is you, if you can break it down you can break it down or you can throw uh, you can jump over the wall hey <laughs> yeah and and you'd probably have all the same problems of that plague information and, and cyber security related stuff with you know, silicon electronic type computation if you were doing it on a biological substrate <laughs> I, I don't think that, that would that all the usual problems would crop up um irrespective of the medium yeah i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i just thought this was pretty cool like well i mean it's it's an interesting idea but it also shows the perspective of what lilith is like she if she gets anywhere that she shouldn't be like by chance she she goes mm-hmm. the end or loses um Nikanj or anybody that uh, and who can also, um, guide her. She's literally a prisoner. Yeah. If you fall somewhere that you cannot and and you cannot get out because there's you know if you are in a room locked room there's always a chance for a person to escape. But if it's a room yeah. that a doesn't have any doors and b only responds to chemical cues that you cannot produce. Yeah. It's, it's not that you don't have the combination, it's that you don't have the, the equipment necessary to enter the combination, yes. right? It's like a, a combination lock when you have no fingers with which to push the buttons. Pretty right? much. You don't have the equipment to interface with the device to try and get out, right? It's a, it's another layer of inaccessible. So I, I feel like, I feel, I feel that Lilith, um, I, I feel her, um, fear i would say and yeah her, it definitely feels claustrophobic yes and also how her own training to train other humans to get used to on kali might be quite a arduous task because i mean the moment anybody asks her about this is like yeah technically we can't escape or we can go anywhere without the on kali because well, basically it's just not possible yeah that that should be um pretty tricky position to find yourself in right yeah uh, i mean if if somebody is uh, oh hi yes so these species have have saved us but you can't do anything you can't escape them you can't do it and they're actually modifying us so that we are more like them uh yeah i don't think if i start a conversation yep. with anybody the first thing i would do is probably shoot myself in the head <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah you don't want to be in the position to have to explain that to other people right because that's uh that's going to be a shoot the messenger kind of a pretty scenario. much <laughs> uh but anyway i think we should uh maybe go to my predictions <laughs> yes that seems like an opportune moment yeah, to do that considering the how dark we're getting with this chapter um so i think so i've separated this because next uh recording will also consider of two chapters is that correct uh, yeah. I think so, yes. Based on so I think yeah. um, two things going to happen, right? So the next chapter, uh, mm-hmm. Nikaj is going to introduce her to more of the Onkali, children Onkali, right? And as all of the children yeah. happen, you know, any circumstance when you're met with, you know, a foreigner or anyone new in the playground, let's say, if I can use that word, playground, um, mm. many interesting things can happen. You know, with any kids, you have people, kids who are, like, shy, kids who are more, like, brave and, like, you know, trying to probe you, see who you really are and how you react, etc., etc. Those little cheeky little yep. shits like me, you know, who, who mess around. <laughs> um, yeah, and prone to being indiscreet, yes. right? Not necessarily sticking to exactly, the things they're supposed exactly. to say. So I think my mm. next prediction is that there's some gonna be some dramas gonna arise. the 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 kids are gonna they're gonna probe um, Liv in a way, but also tell her something that she probably would never hear from the um, from the adults. I would say. Um, mm. Okay, interesting prediction. Um, and I think also this indirectly will let us know more about the culture of Onkali more. Because hmm. interaction with kids, how kids often are um, honest uh, in, the, in their 
attitude and general behavior um, and what they say often you know if if a kid tells you're ugly i'm sorry but you are an ug- uh, ugly that's that's you can't live without otherwise <laughs> sorry um so i expect this is gonna happen this is that basically one kid's gonna call a living ugly and the other kid's gonna say something that she will be horrified of or she didn't realize that something is happening like um, or maybe they were gonna take her to their favorite playground place which basically is like a toxic vat that basically Liv is gonna be shouldn't even get close to it <laughs> just okay. just saying I, I just feel like Fun. when kids are involved who knows what's gonna happen <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think in the chapter 4 because the next chapter is 3 so now chapter 4 mm-hmm. we will be introduced more into Lilith's training so training to okay. like her what her because I remember in chapter five of the section one womb, um, Chitaya said that she will undergo certain training to, uh, and she'll have a job. So I think mm. we'll be introduced to the job that she is supposed to do. Like I mean, like she's the, her job is to yeah. help the other humans to, um, get adjusted to Ankali. But in the same time, I'm sure she'll have other jobs to do that, um, to 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 learn the. Um, what Onkali are. Yeah, and that whole thing of, of her being sent back down to Earth with a troop of people. And, ah, and yes, the survival yes, the survivor skills, skills that, yes. That I mentioned about, yeah. So that that whole situation, how that's going to unfold, how the other people are going to interact with or finding out you know, the, the, their situation mm-hmm. and so on. So yeah, I guess, yeah. Okay. I guess that these are my predictions. So let's see. I hope that I'm not gonna okay. like honestly. I I get I got completely forgotten myself about the book that I'm supposed to each chapter make a prediction. So this time I'm gonna make sure that I do make a prediction. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, whether or not the, your predictions are coming true and how you feel about that. <laughs> I, honestly, I'm really enjoying this book, honestly. and I think from what I've spoken mm. to our few fans. Uh, uh, number one fun I would say is that you know, the, the <laughs> person is enjoying the the book and you know it's I honestly am as well and I also feel sorry for him uh, because he's reading in the way that we are reading like I'm reading with chapter each chapter with section so oh, I wouldn't uh, be I wouldn't have the patience okay. or the will uh, to, to to not to do it. Yeah. Okay. That, that's some yeah. commitment. If he sticks to that, I'll be impressed <laughs> because that's. Uh, some serious self-control <laughs> for the long yeah. haul right everyone <laughs> thank you very much for listening um, I was Michael Glinka thanks for listening I've been Richard Acton and we are on Spotify iTunes Google Play Music Stitcher Podcast uh, Pocket Cast sorry YouTube so and our website is Xenothesis so goodbye bye <laughs>